So Peter says, you need to repent. From what? Repent from what? Verse 36. Therefore, let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God has made that same Jesus who you crucified, both Lord and Christ. And when they heard this, they were pricked in their heart, that's convicted, and said unto Peter and to the rest of the apostles, well, men and brethren, what shall we do? So Peter said unto them, repent. Repent from what? I want to welcome everybody to the conversation tonight. My name is, of course, Daryl Arnaz, and I am with Freedom Creation Emergent Ministries located in the city of Largo, Florida. And I'm so glad that you've tuned into the conversation tonight. We're going to be addressing a subject as part of the Foundation Principles series that we've been talking about. And we're going to talk tonight about water baptism. This is one of those hot button topics in the body of Christ. You know, I know when I posted the uh, some information about is baptism necessary for salvation? I got a couple of emails back already. People wanted to know, well, is the formula necessary? And, you know, does the pastor have to say over the person in the name of Jesus? Or if a person is baptized in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost, does that mean that they're not saved? Well, we want to look at a number of these different um, issues. And I want to say from the outset that there's no way that in a session I can cover all of the detail about water baptism. But I do want to give you enough to clarify why baptism is important for the believer. What is the purpose of baptism? What, what does that mean for the community of faith when we talk about baptism? We're going to look at that. I want to remind you, no matter what platform you're on, if you're watching on HAPS, YouTube, if you're watching on Vimeo, if you're watching on Facebook or one of the other social media uh, platforms. I, I want to encourage you to be sure to like, share, and subscribe uh, to the conversation so that you can be aware when we're uploading or doing additional content. Um, for those that have subscribed to the YouTube channel, I thank you so much. And I want to encourage you, if you haven't subscribed, if you're a first-time listener, I want to encourage you to subscribe to the channel go through the video archive. It's a couple of hundred videos uh, that are already there. And you can just feast to your heart's desire. In fact, many people um, have been sending me emails about different topics. Um, what do I believe about apostles and prophets? What do I believe um, about church structure? What do I believe about uh the baptism of the Holy Ghost, which we're going to look at as well um, as we're talking about doctrine of baptisms. And you will find in the video library that's already on YouTube, you will find something that is approaching or at least has touched on all of these different topics. I've been doing uh, media ministry for a number of years now. I'm new to YouTube, but I've been doing media ministry for a number of years, and I have a lot of content, uh, some from back when I was pastoring in Dayton, Ohio, before I moved to Florida. Um, there's just all kind of content there. So be sure, again, to subscribe to the channel, go into the video archive. If you have any questions about any of the content, that I've shared, be sure to send me an email. I will definitely respond back to you. And again, I want to thank you for 
taking out the time this evening to come and join us for this conversation on doctrine of baptisms. Well, before we go any further, let's just have a word of prayer. Father, we come in the name that is above every name, the name of Jesus. And Father, we thank you so much for the presence of the Holy Spirit who leads us and guides us into all truth. We thank you for the covenant that we have with you through the shed blood of the Lord Jesus. We thank you for the forgiveness of sin. Father, we thank you that we are your righteousness in Christ Jesus. Father, we pray that you will continue to spread your word throughout the earth, that men and women might come to know the saving power of the Lord Jesus. And Holy Spirit, I ask you now to give us all a spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of Christ. Open the eyes of our understanding that we might understand the scriptures. We ask this in the name of Jesus. Amen and amen. Water baptism, as we are looking at the foundational principles of Christ listed in the book of Hebrews, beginning at Rome or Hebrews chapter 5, verse 12, going through Romans chapter 6, verse 2. And it lists the six foundational principles of Christ. That is the foundational teaching that Jesus gave to the apostles that the apostles in turn delivered to the church. So when we talk about, or when I talk about the apostles' doctrine, the apostles' doctrine goes beyond Acts 2 and 38. Now, I know a lot of times people, when you talk about the apostles' doctrine, they say, well, Acts 2, 38, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sin, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. And they say, that's the apostles' doctrine. The apostles' teaching is actually listed throughout the entirety of the New Testament. So the apostles taught more than Acts 2.38. Acts 2.38 is entrance into the community of faith, but there, there's a lot of other teachings that were delivered to the church through the apostles. Hebrews chapter 5 lists the foundational principles of Christ as follows. Number one is repentance from dead works. Number two is faith toward God. Number three is doctrine of baptisms, plural. Number four is the laying on of hands. Number five is resurrection of the dead. Number six is eternal judgment. These are the six foundational principles of Christ. These are the first principles of the oracles of God. It is these principles, these teachings, these that need to be established in our lives, which will root us and ground us in the faith. Once we have those foundations properly laid in our lives, then we can go on to maturity or perfection, completion. Then we can begin to chew on some of the weightier uh, matters of the scriptures. That's once we have the foundations laid in our lives. Now, it is my perspective that as we look out at the body of Christ and we see the division we see the animosity, we see the hostility, we see the judgmentalism that takes place in the body, I'm not talking about the world, I'm talking about in the body. It's evident that we have not had these principles laid in our lives because these principles are also called the milk of the word. So issues of baptism, issues of 
faith, issues of resurrection, uh, issues of the second coming. All of these things are considered to be the milk of the word. And if we are still arguing back and forth about the milk of the word, that actually shows the level or lack thereof of our spiritual maturity. So it is my desire to share these principles with you so that you can then take your scriptures, go back through the scriptures, use your study aids, use your study tools to discover a clearer understanding of what scripture is talking about when it talks about these foundation principles. But tonight, we want to look at water baptism. And blessings to everyone that is joining. If you're watching the replay, we thank you so much uh, for tuning in. But we want to start in talking about baptism. And I want to start in the book of Peter, we want to read the Apostle Peter and what Peter had to say about baptism. And then we're going to jump in and we're going to go into the Gospels and we want to follow what Jesus had to say about baptism. And then we want to look at uh, the apostolic witness in the book of Acts regarding baptism. But in 1 Peter, 1 Peter, Chapter 3, verse 19, it says, well, let's start at verse 18. For Christ also has once suffered for sins, the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but quickened or made alive by the Spirit, by which he went and preached unto the Spirit's spirits in prison, which, note, sometime were disobedient when once the long-suffering of God waited in the days of Noah while the ark was preparing, wherein few, that is, eight souls were saved by water. Peter goes back and he picks up the story of Noah's flood. And he begins to talk about our salvation and our redemption in Christ Jesus. We're in 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 20, which again I read, sometime we're disobedient when once the long suffering of God waited in the days of Noah while the ark was a preparing, wherein few, that is, eight souls were saved by water. Verse 21, the like figure, whereunto even baptism does also now save us, not the putting away of the filth of the flesh. Now note this next part, but the answer of a good conscience toward God by the resurrection of Jesus Christ, who has gone into heaven and is on the right hand of God, angels and authorities and powers being made subject unto him. Peter picks up this idea of baptism and he ties it to Noah's flood. And you'll remember the story. God told Noah, build an ark. uh, It's going to rain. And, but I want you, Noah, to build this ark. And I want you to bring a certain amount of clean animals, certain amount of unclean animals. I want you, I want you and your family and all Noah who believe in the message of the coming judgment. Hear me. All of those who believe in the message of the coming judgment, I want them to come into the ark. Why? Because it's going to rain. And so as Noah preached, the scriptures tell us that the earth opened up 
and water began to shoot up from the earth, water began to drop out of the heavens. So the fountains of the deep were broken up, water came up, water came down, and it flooded the earth. The only people that were saved was Noah and his family. They were saved in the ark. That story becomes a type and a shadow of believers being saved by the grace of God through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. But note, Peter said, it's not the putting away of the filth of the flesh, it's the answer of a good conscience toward God. And we're going to look more at this answer of a good conscience as to why new covenant believers are commanded to be baptized. It's not optional. So this idea of baptism actually has its origin under the first covenant with Moses. That's where we find this first notion of baptism. It is under the Mosaic covenant. And I want to read for just a moment, Deuteronomy chapter 23, and we're going to read verses 9 through 14. That's Deuteronomy. That's in the old covenant. So you got to flip all the way back to the beginning of your Bible. But in Deuteronomy chapter 23, and I'm going to read verse 9 through 14. And this is what it reads. If, he says, when the host goes forth against your enemy, the host being the people of Israel. That's another name that God used for his covenant people, the host. He says, when the host goes forth against your enemy, then keep you from every wicked thing. Verse 10, if there be among you any man that is not clean by reason of uncleanness that may have come to him by night, then he will go abroad out of the camp and he will not come within the camp. Why? because he is unclean. So the camp of Israel was to be clean. It was to be holy. It was to be sanctified. And so here God says, when you go out and you're going into the land and you come into the land to possess the land, if there come in someone who is unclean, he needs to go outside of the camp. But it will be when evening comes that he is to wash himself with water. And when the sun goes down, he will come into the camp again. So this washing of the water has to do with the purification of the flesh under the old covenant. Are you with me? God doesn't want anything unclean in the camp. So if someone has become unclean, he is to go outside the camp, then wash himself with water. Then he can come back into the clean or back into the camp because he is now clean. Verse 14, for the Lord your God walks in the midst of the camp. See, God has always tabernacle with his people. That is what the tabernacle of Israel was about in the wilderness. It just wasn't set up to take up space. That is where the presence of the, of the Lord would manifest in the tabernacle beyond the curtain where the Shekinah glory, the manifest presence of God would hover over the ark Interestingly, it's called the Ark of the Covenant. God is a covenant-keeping God. Stay with me. God is a covenant-keeping God. So he says, 
The Lord walks in the midst of your camp, verse 14, to deliver you and to give up your enemies before you. Therefore, shall your camp be holy, that he see no unclean thing in you and turn away from you. So they were, if they were to become unclean, the the charge was to go outside of the camp, wash yourself, and then come back into the camp. The reason is because God dwelt in the midst of the camp, and he didn't want any uncleanness to defile the camp, because if the camp becomes defiled, the covenant is broken. (laughs) Are y'all with me? God is a covenant-keeping God. So Israel was to keep themselves clean. People who were not washed would be isolated from the people until they had washed with water. Now, I want to point something out about Israel after the flesh. Israel after the flesh had already been saved in the book of Exodus. They were already saved. They were already delivered. They were already declared holy by God. So it wasn't the washing of the water that saved them no more than it was the water that destroyed the the antediluvians or the the generation in Noah's day. It wasn't the water that saved the people. It was God that saved the people. Oh, I hope you're with me. The camp of Israel, it was a holy place. There was to be no uncleanness permitted. All those sin was being atoned for by the priests. You know, they had their daily sacrifices. They had all of their their daily sacrifices for uncleanness, different types. You know, you go back and you read the book of Leviticus and if they committed this trespass, they were to offer that. If they were to commit this trespass, they were to offer that. Why? Because God wanted them to be a holy people set apart for his use. And since God is a holy God, he requires holiness of his people. So he provided a way to be able to declare the people holy. These are key words. God provided a way to declare the people holy. They were made holy because they were declared holy by God. Y'all stay with me now. See, this is When we talk about repentance from dead works, it's already understood that what saves is the death, burial, and resurrection of the Lord Jesus. That's what saves. Baptism does not save, but it is required as an act of obedience once we are saved. (laughs) Y'all stay with me. Sin was atoned for. They had ceremonial washings, which was actually symbolic of the spiritual cleansing that would come to us through the Lord Jesus. This type of cleansing was known in Israel and it was practiced by Orthodox Jews. And this baptism was known as the mikvah, M-I-K-V-A. It was the mikvah. It's a ceremonial washing that has to do with the cleansing of impurity and uncleanness in the people so that they can continue to have fellowship with a holy God. Are you with me? Let's fast forward. When John the Baptist came preaching in the wilderness of Judea, let's let's read that. Matthew, let's read Matthew chapter... Three, it says, in those days came John the Baptist preaching in the wilderness of Judea. John was known as John the Baptist. Baptist wasn't John's last name. 
Baptism is what John did. So John became known as John the Baptist or John Baptist, John the Baptizer, John the Immerser, because that is what John was sent to do. John was sent to baptize, and it was a specific baptism that John was called to baptize with. Here we are. In those days came John the Baptist preaching in the wilderness of Judea. Note his message, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. So the reason that the people needed to repent, and in this sense, repentance for Israel simply meant a return to covenant. They, they had been in captivity under Babylon. Some of them had gone into captivity into Assyria. They were now in captivity under Rome. They were living in a Roman province. They, they had gone through Hellenism under the Greeks. And so when John came baptizing, John was calling the people. He had a baptism of repentance. They were to turn from the direction that they were going and they were to return to the covenant that God had established with the people of Israel throughout their whole existence. So he came preaching, saying, repent, because the kingdom of heaven is at hand. For this is he that was spoken of by the prophet Isaiah, saying, the voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make his path straight. Now watch. And the same John had his raiment of camel's hair and a leathern girdle about his loins and his meat, his food was locusts and wild honey. And it says, then went out. Now note, then went out <laughs> to him, Jerusalem and all Judea and the region round about Jordan. This is a mass national repentance that Israel is experiencing under the ministry of John the Baptist. It wasn't just a few folk going to get baptized. This was a national repentance. John is calling a nation to repent. God, J John is calling God's covenant people back to repentance. Why? Or back through repentance. Why? Because Messiah is here. The Christ is here. The promised one is here. Stay with me now. <laughs> so, verse 5, Then went out to him Jerusalem and all Judea and all the region round about Jordan and were baptized of him in Jordan, confessing their sin. This is John's baptism. First thing I want to mention here is John's baptism is a old covenant baptism. John's baptism is not a new covenant baptism. Y'all stay with me. They came to be baptized of him in the Jordan. Note, confessing their sins. We're going to see something totally different when we move into the New Testament. We're going to see a difference in the baptism preached by the apostles than the baptism that's preached by John. And I think many times this is where we kind of get confused about water baptism because we're tying water baptism back to John the Baptist. That's not a new covenant baptism. That's an old covenant baptism. You say John? Yes. John was an old covenant prophet. The new covenant was not established until the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. The new covenant was confirmed through the shedding of the blood of the lamb, Jesus. That brought in 
the new covenant. John is a old covenant prophet with an old covenant message. <laughs> Stay with me. I feel like teaching. So, if we go down to verse 11, it says this, John or Matthew 3, verse 11, this is what John says. I indeed baptize you with water unto repentance. Now, remember, the first foundational principle that we have in the new covenant is repentance from dead works. Now, I pointed out when I talked about repentance from dead works, it's repentance from dead works. It's not repentance from sin. It's repentance from dead works. You say, well, what's the difference? You have to go back and listen to the series that I did or the, the conversation that I did on repentance from dead works. It's works of righteousness. It's stuff that we try to do to cover up our nakedness. But, I digress. He says, I indeed baptize you with water unto repentance, but he that is coming after me is mightier than I, whose shoes I'm not worthy to bear. He, now stay with me, talking about Jesus, he will baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire, whose fan is in his hand, he's going to thoroughly purge his floor and gather his wheat into the garner, but he will burn up the chaff with, with unquenchable fire. Then came Jesus from Galilee to Jordan unto John to be baptized of him. Now, here's the first thing I want to, here's, here's something I want to ask you. Did Jesus have any sin in his life that he needed to repent from? No, he never sinned. Was there anything that ever happened in Jesus's life which would have made him unclean? No. So Jesus had no reason to be baptized. He never straight away from the covenant. He never worshiped false gods. Yet, the scripture says that when John the Baptist came preaching in the wilderness, calling the people back, baptizing them for <laughs> unto repentance, Jesus came and Jesus was baptized by John. Jesus is setting a pattern. Listen, Jesus is setting a pattern for the believer. Jesus is modeling what we are to do. He didn't need to do it, but he needed to model for humanity how humanity comes into right relationship with the Father. And the very first thing that he did is he submitted to baptism. Stay with me now. <laughs> Stay with me. It says, Jesus came to be baptized. John didn't allow him, saying, I have need to be baptized of you, and you're coming to me? And Jesus answered and said, allow it to be so for now, for thus it becomes us to fulfill all righteousness. Jesus had to submit to everything required by the Father in order to be the perfect sacrifice. And step one was baptism. Jesus is God manifested in the flesh. You understand what I'm saying? Jesus is God manifested in the flesh. But as the second man, the last Adam, he had to perfectly obey what God requires of humanity. So he submitted to baptism. Did he get baptized to become 
the son of God? No, he was born the son of God. In like manner, you and I, we don't get baptized to become sons and daughters of God. We get baptized because we are, and the Father requires it. And so as Peter said, baptism serves as a figure of water baptism, or Noah's day served as a figure of baptism, whereby baptism does now save us, not the putting away of the filth of the flesh. It's the answer of a good conscience. In other words, the, the conscience is clear now in dealing with the things of God because we are obeying what the Father commands us to do. Are you with me? And so because we obey, we have a clear conscience when it comes to God. This is why for the believer, baptism shouldn't even be an issue. I know when I was baptized, when I came up out of the water, I knew that I had new life. It's the answer of a good conscience. There's no magical element in the water that saves. So I don't believe in baptismal regeneration as some people teach. But I do believe in submitting to baptism in the same way that I believe that we ought to partake of communion. Communion's not an, uh, not an issue for people. So why is it an issue for people when it comes to baptism? Because the enemy understands what new covenant baptism is. And we're going to get there in just a moment. We're, we, we're going to get there. Stay with me. <laughs> It says, suffer it to be so for now, because it becomes us to fulfill all righteousness. And so he suffered him. And Jesus, now watch what happens next. And Jesus, when he was baptized, he went up straightway out of the water and lo, the heavens were open unto him. And he saw the spirit of God descending like a dove and lightning upon him. And lo, a voice from heaven saying, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. So what is happening here? Because chapter four, verse one says, then was Jesus led up of the spirit into the wilderness. So we have a couple of things happening. We have Jesus, the carpenter, becoming Jesus, the Christ. We have Jesus who was opposed the son of Joseph, being acknowledged as Jesus, the son of God. We have the man Christ Jesus now entering into a ministry powered by, and he's anointed by the spirit. When did it happen though? It happened when he was baptized. What happened? The heavens were open unto him. He now has access Oh, <laughs> glory. He, 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 he has access. The heavens were open, and he saw the spirit descending in the form of a dove and lighting upon him. And a voice came from heaven saying, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. He's getting affirmation of who he is. Listen, Jesus, this is Jesus the son of man. This is the man, Christ Jesus. Now, again, I have to say, Jesus is 100% God, but he's 100% man. What he did in his earthly ministry, he did as a man submitted to God, not as God controlling man. Let me say that again. What Jesus did in his earthly ministry he did as a man submitted to God. He didn't do it as God controlling man. See, this is why John gives, 1 John gives as one of the tests of the spirit, 1 John chapter four, whosoever believes that Jesus Christ is coming the flesh. See, he had to be fully human. 
And this is what we're seeing. We're seeing Jesus submitting to baptism. He comes up out of the baptism. The heavens are open. He sees the spirit descending. And then he goes forth, led of the spirit into the wilderness. It could be one of the reasons some people are not really experiencing being led of the spirit is because they've never heard that voice saying, this is my beloved son. This is my beloved daughter. They really may not have ever heard the confirming voice of God, that inner witness that they are in fact, a child of God. That's the answer of the clear conscience. Baptism is the ordinance, the ceremony, if, if, if we can use that word. I know that scares some people. The entrance into the covenant community of God. That's where we are washed and we're made clean. It's nothing in the water. Please understand what I'm saying. It's the act of obedience is what it gets into. And so for people who have major issues with baptism, and they would say, well, baptism is not necessary. Baptism is not important. Baptism doesn't have anything to do with your salvation. And, you know, I mean, I understand, you know, some of what they're talking about, but we need to keep this stuff in perspective. God gave a process through which we go from faith to faith. He's given us the teachings in his word, Hebrews 5, 12 through 6, 2, which become the milk of the word so that we can grow thereby. So we're still arguing about baptism. How spiritually mature are we? So John came baptizing. Hmm. The Jews understood Jerusalem. Who did it say went out? It said that uh, all Jerusalem then went out to him, Jerusalem and all Judea and all the region round about the Jordan. They understood the message of John. They understood the importance of this submitting to this baptism to be clean, to come back to covenant. So what does this baptism actually symbolize? Romans chapter six. Now let's look at new covenant baptism. Romans chapter six. Well, before we go to Romans, let's stop by Acts for a minute. This is after the resurrection. This is after the ascension. This is after the descent of the Holy Spirit. And Peter's preaching and, pre and Peter lays out for the people that were there. And it says, you know, that Parthians, Medes, Elamites, dwellers of Mesopotamia, in Judea, Cappadocia, Pontus, Asia, Pergia, Pamphylia, Egypt, parts of Libya, about Serene, strangers of Rome, Jews and proselytes, Cretes and Arabians. There was all kind of folk there. There were people from, from you know, worldwide. You know, this is not a single ethnic group that we know as Israel that was at the day of Pentecost. No, there were Jews and devout men from every nation under heaven. And they had all come to Jerusalem for the feast of Pentecost. And then this outpouring takes place. Peter begins to, to proclaim to them the message of Christ, the message of Jesus being uh, the Messiah, the message of be of Jesus being exactly who the scripture says, and then tying the Pentecostal baptism of the spirit back to the prophet Joel to let people know, hey, this is the day now God's pouring out his spirit upon all flesh. He's just not pouring his spirit out upon priests and upon prophets and upon kings. No, he's pouring his spirit out on all flesh, the same spirit that powered the Old Testament saints, that same spirit is now available to all flesh, to every man, woman, boy, and girl, not a elect select class 
whosoever will, Jesus said, let him take of the waters of life freely. And so Peter's preaching. And <laughs> in verse 36, he says this. He said, therefore, let all in the house of Israel know assuredly that God has made that same Jesus. Note the emphasis on Jesus. God has made that same Jesus who you crucified, both Lord and Christ. And when they heard this, they were pricked in their heart and said unto Peter and to the rest of the apostles, men and brethren, what shall we do? Note the response, verse 38. Then Peter said unto them, repent. Now, it sounds to me that Peter is starting his message the same way John the Baptist started his. Remember, John the Baptist came preaching with a baptism of repentance. Peter is preaching Christ as the fulfillment of God's righteousness. So his message is uniquely different from John's message, as is his baptism is uniquely different from John's baptism. I'm talking about Peter. So Peter says, you need to repent. From what? Repent from what? Verse 36. Therefore, let all the house of Israel know shortly that God has made that same Jesus who you crucified, both Lord and Christ. And when they heard this, they were pricked in their heart, that's convicted, and said unto Peter and to the rest of the apostles, well, men and brethren, what shall we do? So Peter said unto them, repent. Repent from what? Repent from their rejection of Jesus. See, we've, we have to read scripture in context. Because what happens is we pull scripture out of context and then we build doctrines. And then these doctrines tend to cause confusion. Peter is telling them, Peter told them, you just crucified the Lord of glory. This Jesus that you crucified, God has made both Lord and Christ. And they said, what should we do? Peter said, repent. Repent from what? Repent from your rejection of Jesus. He didn't tell him repent from sin. That was John's message. <laughs> Y'all understand what I'm saying? Now, let me say this, because I know some people automatically going to say, oh, so you saying that a, that a person doesn't need to repent from sin? Listen, folks, if, if, you, if you heard the, the, the conversation on repentance from dead works, if you heard the conversation on faith toward God, we're dealing now with doctrine of baptisms. So I would encourage you, if you think that's what I'm saying, that I encourage you to go back and listen to the teaching on repentance from dead works. Of course, a people or a person should repent from sin to receive Christ. That's a given. <laughs> let's, let's not set up straw men. That's a given. But that comes from conviction of the Holy Ghost, when you've actually seen what your sin and my sin has done to Christ. It's like the song we listened to in, in opening. Just for me, Jesus came and he did it just for me. What did he do? He died on Calvary. He became sin for me. He knew no sin, but he took my sin upon the cross. 
my repentance is my repentance from what my sin has done to Christ. You understand what I'm saying? So I'm not minimizing sin. I'm trying to put Jesus back into the gospel. <laughs> Let's put Jesus back into the gospel. So he says, okay, you need to repent. And then you need to be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission, for the cleansing, for the wiping away, for the covering of your sin, and you'll receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. So through your baptism, listen to me, through your baptism in Jesus' name, what is significant about the name of Jesus? There's no other name given under heaven whereby we must be saved other than the name of Jesus. So why do people have an issue with being baptized in his name? What's the real problem? See, I hear, I hear the theological debates. I, I, I hear all of that. Uh, should I be baptized in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost? Or should I be baptized in Jesus' name? Well, if I was baptized in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost, does that mean I'm not saved? You know, or, or if you weren't baptized in Jesus' name, you're not saved. And so we start getting into all of those discussions, which really are distractions. <laughs> See, we're looking at a formula as opposed to what is believing or believer's baptism actually about what takes place. The first thing that takes place is we are identified with Jesus. And, 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 and Peter made no bones about that. He said, this Jesus that you crucified has become both Lord and Christ. Well, what should we do? You need to repent and you need to be baptized in the name of that Jesus. You need to identify with that Jesus. And that's what our baptism does. It identifies us with the work of Jesus. That's what baptism is about. So I don't understand why people argue about the being baptized in Jesus' name. I don't understand the argument. <laughs> I, I, I really don't. So, so with full transparency, let me say this. I was saved in 1976. I was ordained in ministry um, in 1983, but I'd been preaching, I'd been teaching, I was licensed, but I was ordained in ministry. And I was baptized in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Because that's all I really knew. I knew people who believed in G what, what, what we call Jesus' name baptism. I knew people. But there was always something that didn't sit right with me. <laughs> it wasn't until 2000. What's this, 2021? No, this is 2022. It went until 2020 when I was baptized in Jesus' name. But I've been saved since 1976. <laughs> Let me say that again. I didn't get baptized in Jesus' name until 2020. I got saved in 76. So when people ask me, well, the people that are baptized in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost, are they saved? My question is, have they accepted Jesus? I mean, actually accepted. I'm not talking about just went through a ritual. Because I know people who were baptized in Jesus' name as a ritual. <laughs> Doesn't mean they saved. Jesus saves. Okay, so I, I kind of I kind of want to clear this, clear the air on this. And if you have any, you know, disagreements and discussions and you actually want to have a conversation about it, send me an email and we can definitely connect, right? We can definitely connect because I can't cover all of this. 
So Peter says, repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ. And you'll receive remission of sin. Every case of baptism listed in the book of Acts, they baptized one way. They baptized in the name of Jesus. And when you understand the power of that name, when you understand the power of that name is because of whose name it is. Jesus mean, that's English, Jesus Yahshua or Yahshua means Yahweh has become salvation. That's what the name literally means. Yahweh has become salvation. You know, like we had Jehovah Sitkanu, Jehovah Nisi, Jehovah Rapha. You know, we have all of these compound names to that describe the actual work and function of Yahweh, the one true and living God. Well, Jesus, Yahshua, means God is salvation. That's literally what the name means. So when you take on that name, you're taking on the name of God, who is your salvation. That's why there's power in the name. And interestingly, a lot of people that I that I hear and I've talked to that don't really believe in the power of the name of Jesus, they also have an issue with baptism. This this is these are just things I've observed over the years. Uh, because it appears in the book of Acts that the name of Jesus, baptism, water, and baptism, Holy Spirit, are all tied together. There's something about those three. And this is how we see the apostles functioning in the book of Acts. And I think that's why many people say, well, uh, the apostles' doctrine is Acts 2.38. This is, this is where a lot of that theology comes from, which I agree with. But I believe that the Apostles' Doctrine expands beyond Acts 2.38. Acts 2.38 is the introduction to the teachings of Jesus, which we call the Apostles' Doctrine. And you won't find any other kind of baptisms in the book of Acts. And then for people who want to argue, well, what about this person? Or what about the Philippian jailer? Or what about this person? Or what about this person? It doesn't actually say in the name of Jesus. My question becomes, what's the problem? I mean, why are we trying to prove? <laughs> why are we trying to prove what's evident through the scripture and we want to disprove it? Because we have a problem with the name of Jesus and we have a problem with baptism. So the real question is, how is your conscience when it comes to your relationship with God? Because that's, this is what baptism deals with. It deals with the answer of a good conscience. And the name can only operate, the power of the name can only operate by faith. But if we don't have a clear conscience before God, it's difficult to exercise Faith. Do you see how this kind of builds on each? It, it, it kind of builds. So let's let's go further. Let's look at Romans. And let me try to close this up real quick. Romans chapter six. And it says this. Romans chapter six. I'm going to start at verse one. What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin? Paul is writing to the church at Rome. He's writing to Christians. He's writing to believers. He's writing to people who have already come into the faith. He's teaching them now. He said, what shall we say? Should we continue in sin so that grace can abound? God forbid. How shall we that are dead to sin 
live any longer therein. Don't you know, now watch Paul, don't you know that so many of us as were baptized into Christ were baptized into his death. Well, what baptism is Paul referring to? Paul is referring to the same baptism that we see in the book of Acts. That baptism. Remember when Paul had, I think it's uh, Ephesians 19, somewhere around in there, and it says that he he, he went into the upper coast and, and, and finding certain disciples in the, in the region of Ephesus, he asked them, did you receive the Holy Ghost when you believed? And they said, we haven't so much as heard whether there be any Holy Ghost. He said, well, unto what then were you baptized? They said, under John's baptism. Remember we talked about John's baptism? But Paul said, well, John did baptize you with water, saying unto the people to repent. But he said that there's coming one after you, whose shoes I am not worthy to unleash, he shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with power. And when they heard this, it says that, let me go back and read that. Hold your place in Romans for a minute. Let me, let's take a side trip. Acts chapter 19. Paul having passed through the upper coast. All right. So verse four says this, John, or I'm sorry, Acts chapter 19, and I'm going to start at verse three. He said unto them, unto what then were you baptized? They said unto John's baptism. No, it says that he found, found certain disciples in verse one. So these were disciples. He said, well, unto what then were you baptized? They said, unto John's baptism. So Paul said, John did indeed baptize with the baptism of repentance, saying unto the people that they should believe on him which should come after him, that is on Christ Jesus. And when they heard this, note verse five, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. So now they're, they were identifying with John's message through submitting to water baptism. Here, these disciples are identifying with Jesus through submitting to water baptism. You say, well, why do you say it was water baptism? No, when they heard this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Well, what other kind of baptism was it? Some people say, well, it was spirit baptism. No, it wasn't spirit baptism because in verse six, it says when Paul had laid his hands on them, the Holy Ghost came on them and they spoke with tongues and prophesied and all the men were about 12. That is spirit baptism. Verse five is not spirit baptism. It's water baptism in the name of Jesus. That's the only baptism we see in the book of Acts. That is new covenant, New Testament baptism. People say, well, 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 so are you saying, you know, this goes back to this argument. So are you, so are you saying that if I were baptized in the, in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost, that I'm not saved? I didn't say that. I was saved for 30, 30, 40 years, only baptized in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Because the baptism doesn't save. Jesus saves. Baptism identifies us with the work, with the mission, with the purpose. So here are disciples who only knew John's baptism, but they believed it and they were walking in it. When they come across Paul, Paul now gives them more information. He gives them more light. He connects them to the end result of John's message, which was the coming of Christ. And when they got a fuller understanding of the purpose and the work of Jesus, now they were baptized. Actually, they were re-baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. They took on his name. Then Paul laid hands on them. 
and they will fill with the Holy Ghost. So again, we see the same element, water baptism, the affirmation, the confirmation, and then we see the baptism of the Holy Ghost. This is what happened with Jesus. He submitted to water baptism. He got the affirmation of who he was and he took on his father's name. That's why Jesus could say, I haven't come in my name. I came in my father's name. So God could say, this is my beloved son. I am come in my father's name. See? Glory to God. Paul laid hands. So, so, but, but what actually is happening with this baptism, right? In Jesus' name. What, what, what's happening with this water baptism here? Let's go back to Romans chapter 6. Let me try to close it up. Romans chapter 6. This is good. I hope you're learning something. And again, be sure to share and subscribe and like this conversation. Don't you know, verse 3, Romans 6 and 3, that so many of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ, we were baptized into his death. We are identifying with the death of the Lord Jesus. Therefore, verse 4, we are buried with him by baptism, that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. For if we have been planted together in the likeness of his death, we shall be also in the likeness of his resurrection, knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him so that the body of sin might be destroyed, that henceforth we not serve sin. When we submit to the waters of baptism in the name of Jesus, identifying with the work of Christ, we are identifying with his crucifixion, his burial, and his resurrection. Like Christ was crucified, he was buried. We are buried in the water of baptism because through that, our old man is identifying with Christ. Then just like Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of his father, we are also raised to walk in the newness of life. We are taking upon ourselves the new creation. You remember Genesis chapter one. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth and the earth was without form and void and darkness was upon the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God was hovering over the face. Oh, glory. The Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. And then God said. And so here is a earth because later on, God in verse 9 said, Let the waters under the heaven be gathered together unto one place and let the dry land appear and it was so. And so even in the first creation, we see this emergence of creation coming up out of the water. Glory to God. Coming up out of the water, you see. And this theme continues down through the scriptures. And so Romans says that we were buried with him by baptism into death. Now, let's look real quickly at Colossians chapter 2. And we'll look at verse 11. Colossians chapter 2, verse 11. And we read. In whom, speaking of Christ, well, let's go up, let's go back up to verse 9. Well, let's go to verse 8, Colossians 2 and 8. Beware, he says, 
Lest any man spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit after the tradition of men and after the rudiments of the world and not after Christ. For in him, speaking of Christ, dwells all the fullness of the Godhead bodily and you are complete in him. See, we are identified with Christ. When do we become identified with Christ? In our baptism. <laughs> We took on his name. You are complete in him, which is the head of all principality and power, in whom also you're circumcised. This is covenant language. You're circumcised with the circumcision made without hands and putting off the body of the sins of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ. When did this happen? Buried with him in baptism wherein also you are risen with him through the faith of the operation of God who has raised him from the dead. So the very first thing Jesus commands us is to be baptized. He told the disciples, go into all of the world and, and preach the gospel, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe, to do all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I'm with you always, even unto the end of the world. Verse 19, he said, what? All, he said, go into all the world, teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. He said, well, Jesus said, in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. And that's what they did. The name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost is Jesus. Jesus said, I didn't come in my name. I came in my father's name. Now, the Holy Ghost, who the father will send in my name, he's going to lead you and guide you into all one truth. Because it's in Christ, the whole fullness of the Godhead dwells in bodily form. And all of it is identified with the name of Jesus because there is no other name. See, this is why the enemy doesn't like the believer to understand the power of the name. So he fights about a formula. The apostles did exactly what Jesus commanded, but they baptized in the name of Jesus because they had a revelation of God manifested in the flesh. Romans chapter or Colossians, we read, right? <laughs> I get excited with this. So let's look at, uh, Colossians chapter 3, and we'll look at verse 3. Oh, no, am I? Got another Bible falling apart. Colossians chapter 3 and verse 3. This is what he says. We'll start at verse 1. If you then be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above, where Christ sits on the right hand of God. Set your affection on things above, not on things on the earth, because you are dead and your life is hid with Christ in God. When was your life hid with Christ in God? Your life was hid with Christ in God. When you identified with Christ and your old man was crucified and your old man was buried, you were identified with Christ, your life is hidden with Christ in God. And all of this took place through that baptism. It's not the water. It's the fact that the water is symbolic of the grave in which our old man, that's the sin nature, lies dead and defeated. But it also symbolizes the washing away of our sin through the blood of Jesus. And when we rise out of the water as new creatures in Christ Jesus, we rise to walk in the newness of life. It is through baptism that we demonstrate symbolically what we truly are as new creations in Christ. And that the life that we are now living, we live it by faith in his sustaining grace. But the beginning of the Christian walk begins with 
baptism. That's the first thing we are commanded in the scriptures to do. <laughs> That's the first thing. So, so how can we say that we love God, but we don't do what he said? Jesus said, if you love me, just keep my commandments. In other words, if you love me, just do what I, just do what I command you to do. I'm not giving you suggestions. I'm giving you commandments. Mark 16, verse 15. And I know Pete, you know, I know there are some individuals who have a problem with this passage as well. So if they if they want to say, well, that doesn't apply, okay, it doesn't apply to them. It's in the word, so it applies to me, it applies to you. So if people choose to remove things from the scripture that they say it doesn't apply, just don't let it apply to them. Don't let people rob you of your faith and of your victory in Christ Jesus. I don't know who that was for, but it was for somebody. Mark 16, verse 15. He said unto them, go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He that believes and is baptized shall be saved, but he that doesn't believe will be damned. Now, again, that's not saying that baptism saves. He said, go preach. He that believes and is baptized will be saved. Because the, the, the idea is that the believer understands the connection before him. From, uh, the believer understands the connection with them receiving the grace of God through Christ by which they are saved, and then identifying with his work of the death, burial, and resurrection through baptism. He that believes and is baptized, because it was understood, believers are baptized. Are you listening? But he that believes not will be damned, because it's obvious if they don't believe, they're not going to submit to baptism. A believer will because a believer understands what baptism is actually about. Romans 6, Colossians 2. He that believes and is baptized shall be saved. Does baptism save? No. Baptism identifies us with the finished work of the Savior who is Jesus. Jesus saves. Baptism is my declaration that I identify with this Jesus who died on Calvary, that this Jesus who took my sin, that this Jesus who sacrificed so that I might have the right to the tree of life. My baptism is publicly declaring, I identify with that Jesus. So when I am baptized, I am calling on the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. I'm calling on his name and I am taking on his name. I am taking on his work in my life. Hallelujah. The power of the name of Jesus is actually first realized in your baptism. That's the first command. And, and, and my brothers and sisters, if we have a problem obeying the first command. <laughs> How, what's going to happen with the second, the third, the fourth, and all of the other commands that, that God is going to give us in our journey? How are we going to learn to be led by the Spirit if we can't submit to the voice of the Lord and the requirement of the Lord to be baptized? We can't do the first thing because we want to wrap it up and tangle it up in formulas, and we want to tangle it up in ceremonies. 
The baptism is the entrance into the covenant community. The baptism is identifying us with Christ and that circumcision of the heart that brings us into covenant. That water that serves to remind us that we have been cleansed by the work of God, that, that water that reminds us that the God that we serve is the same God who caused the earth to stand out of the water in the first creation. And now in the second creation, he has brought forth new life in Christ. That is just hopefully enough to stir up your pure mind to really want to search the scriptures and say, Father, teach me, teach me these foundation principles. Let me understand what baptism is all about. You know, you can ask me, you can ask this person, you can ask the next person, you can ask the next person, but who you need to be asking is the Lord Jesus himself. Lord, teach me about my baptism. Lord, teach me. Is baptism necessary for salvation? Baptism is a part of the blessing of salvation. Amen. Amen. And I really do trust and hope that you got something out of this particular conversation. Again, if you have any questions, you can feel free to write me. My email is on the screen. Be sure to visit the website freedomcreation.net. We're going to be starting a new series of classes that I do. These are online uh, sessions that we do via Zoom. Uh, those classes are typically Sunday evenings at 7.30 p.m. And I'm, I'm weighing be in between 7 and 7.30 p.m. There is a registration that is involved. You can find out more about that information on the website. Just look under classes and you'll see the information on the next uh, series of classes that we're going to be doing. We're actually going to be finishing up the book of Revelation. We're going to be looking at Revelation 17, 18, 19, and 20. We're going to be looking at Mystery Babylon. And this is a, th this is a series that I really believe is challenging a lot of people but it is at the same time driving people into prayer, driving people into a more intense search of the scriptures. Because beloved, if you haven't realized that we are living in interesting times right now, we're living in interesting times. And we want to just be sure that we are people that can hear the voice of God and we can be led by the spirit of God. And I'm not talking about woo-woo spirituality. I'm talking about things that are deeply rooted in the foundations of the word of God. Amen and amen. Well, again, be sure to like, share, subscribe. Here's some additional information about the ministry. I will talk with you all next time. Peace and blessings. Hallelujah.